I don't know whether it's afternoon or, or evening where you are. Here it's late afternoon, there it's almost evening, but I see it's still pretty light outside. So it's good to be here. It, it's a pleasure, really, to gather together for the Dharma. Because uh, it's a moment of peace and a moment of sanity. I, I really appreciate you know, being invited to go somewhere and share in that peace and sanity, which is so necessary in, an, in a very demanding world. Uh, it's possible that the world has always been demanding. If you're human, you experience it as demanding, but it maybe even if you're not human, maybe you don't have that idea that it's demanding, but maybe it's still demanding. The Buddha seemed to think that this was the case, that the world has always been demanding for us. But he had the faith. And I suppose sometimes I think it was the, the arrogance, you know, to think that he could find a way out of it or a way into it so that you could live with peace and sanity anyway. And, and he did. He did find that way. And so uh, we're all grateful for that. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Even, even in the world as it is, as demanding as it is, we don't need to make it different for uh, us to live in it with some peace and some sanity. We don't need a different world. Or maybe we would like that there would be a different world. But whether or not we do find a different world, e even the way we are now, even the way the world is right now, there's a joyful way to live and, and see life. And that's the brilliant proposition that the Buddha put forward for us and, and, and we're finding it. So even every time we get together, you know, we feel it among us. So it's always a pleasure. Today is uh, July 14th. Maybe you know it's, it's Bastille Day today. So happy, happy Bastille Day. Did you know, do people know that anymore? Do people know that it's Bastille Day on July the 14th? I, I don't know if <laughs> people know this anymore. But this is the day, July 14th, 1789, when the um, French citizens of Paris, being extremely frustrated with their fairly spectacularly unjust government, stormed the Bastille. And that was uh, one of the key events of the French Revolution. So in France now, where they, like we, celebrate the American Revolution, they celebrate the French Revolution. So this is a big day for them, a national holiday. We also know about storming the Bastille, uh, in our case, the, the capital. Uh, history repeats itself over and over again in a very complicated way. And, and it's sometimes it's, you think you know, but you don't necessarily know who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Things happen sometimes gradually, sometimes drastically. And because we are always in the middle of things and we don't have any perspective, therefore, we don't ever know, you know what is happening, but somehow we take our stand in the middle of it somehow, somewhere, based, we hope, on what's best within us. And then if we're lucky, we live long enough to see what happens in the future as the result of what has happened in the past. But uh, since history keeps going, the results are always provisional. According to Buddhist texts, 
you read this in many places uh, in Mahayana sutras and in Pali Canon sutras, history actually does have an end, sort of, temporarily, because uh, a world system appears and then eventually is destroyed. So the history of that world system ends and another world system is created and history begins again. So all, all, all of which is to say, uh, happy Bastille Day. Maybe you're having a party after the Dharma talk. I hope so, to celebrate. So uh, today I want to talk about uh, or around somehow uh, my recent uh, book, When You Greet Me, I Bow. It's been a busy time for me because a lot of my poetry books have come out around the same time. So there's was a book in March called Nature, poetry book, book in April called um, There Was a Clattering As, a pandemic poem. And then uh, When You Greet Me, I Bow came out in May and I'm reading, uh, proofreading for another book that's coming out soon. So it's a little confusing which book uh, is which. I don't know how all that happened. But this is what happens when you have a writing habit. Books appear. This one, uh, When You Greet Me, I Bow, is actually uh, a book that I didn't exactly write, or maybe you could say I've been writing it all along. It's a collection of 40 or so years of essays about the Dharma. I don't know why I keep writing stuff. To be honest with you, I, I, I don't know whether it does anybody any good. I hope it does, but I don't, I can't really say. But uh, anyway, like everybody else, I am the person I am. I didn't place an order for my karma. It just appears. And then I have to answer for it. So if you if you are living within this condition, which uh, may or may not be a positive one of being a writer, that's what happens. Time goes by 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years if you're lucky. And before you know it, there are many, many pages and many, many books. So in this case, I'm, I'm very lucky uh, and very grateful to my editor, Cynthia Schrager, who found out where all these essays were and sleuthed them out from various obscure places sometimes and, and evaluated them and made a selection of them and thought about them to the point where she figured out, I didn't know this myself, that all this time I've been thinking about four things, more or less. This, this is what she figured out. So the four things I've been thinking about that comprise the four uh, sections of this essay book are uh, relationship, uh, the emptiness teachings, of Buddhism, which are so great. They're so wonderful, unlike anything that I'm aware of. A culture and the shaping of culture because Dharma is also a culture. It's a way of talking, it's a way of thinking and feeling and, and living and wearing clothes and, and eating food in a certain way, as you, as you guys well know. And all of this we're borrowing from Asia, even though those of us who have been brought up in the West, whatever our uh, cultural background, if we've been brought up in the West in these times, we are very unlike the traditional Asian 
folks who created Buddha Dharma. So it's a question of culture. And I've been thinking about that also all this time. And the fourth topic uh, covered in the essay book uh, is engagement, which I know is a crucial topic for Upaya. It's really where Upaya gets its name. It's the question, uh, how, that, how do we as, as faithful Dharma practitioners influenced in everything we do by Dharma engage in the world? Since really there is no way not to be engaged in the world because just like Michael Jackson saying, we are the world. And wherever we go, we take the world with us. So it's not like there's a choice. We are and must be engaged in the world. So these are the four topics in my, in my book. And then uh, Cynthia had the idea that before each of these four sections of the book, I would write some contemporaneous notes reflecting on these essays that I wrote so long ago, because of course, I'm a different person, right, than I was long ago. And, and the times in which I wrote the essays are different. So they all read differently, and I had different things to think and feel. And, and isn't that something that we're always thinking and feeling differently because the world moves differently and we move differently all the time? It's funny because the words don't change when you publish, right? The words just are sitting there and they're going to be the same decades later, but they're going to mean something different in the different times. So I, I write a little bit about that for each of the four sections. So it's not just a collection of essays written a while ago, it's also some comments by me contemporaneously on those essays. So that's just a little thumbnail sketch about what this book is. So it's different from other Dharma books that I've written or other people have written. It's not also not a collection of talks, you know, it's not Dharma talks. It's a different thing, a Dharma talk from a Dharma essay. So anyway, uh, today uh, in my talk, I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, relationship. On Saturday, I think I'll, uh, at that workshop, I think I'll focus uh, the attention on emptiness teachings and on engagement, but for, for, for this evening or afternoon or whatever it is, relationship. Now, I've come to the thought, you know, after all this time, that Dharma is all about, and maybe even you could say only about relationship. Actually, what does Nagarjuna's great analysis of the concept of shunyata, emptiness, come to, if not relationship? Emptiness, he says, isn't anything other than relationship. But here, relationship includes more than what we usually think of as relationship. Relationship includes Solitude, silence, perception. It includes the mystery of the thinking mind and the uncanny fact that we live in a world somehow that is always on the point of fading away. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you a couple of Zen stories that I tell at the beginning of the title essay, the, the first essay in the book is, is the title essay called When You Greet Me, I Bow. And, and it starts out with a couple of stories that I'm going to share with you. A long time, who was a Zen, became later a Zen teacher, but at the beginning of this story, he, he's a guy who makes rice cakes. Uh, I guess he had a little bakery making rice cakes. But he, but he, made, he met uh, 
a Zen priest named uh, Tian Huang, and he decided to sell his bakery and go follow Tian Huang and, and become a Zen student, kind of like you guys in the Zendo. I guess you closed your bakeries and or whatever it was, maybe you had a sandal making shop or something and you, and you closed it up and you came to Upaya. He did the same. Tian Huang was really impressed with him and said, look, you be my attendant and I will teach you the essential Dharma gate. And Long Tan was really thrilled that he was gonna get that kind of special opportunity. So after about a year, Long Tan said to Tian Huang, well, I arrived about a year ago and you, and you said you were gonna teach me, but so far nothing. And Tian Huang, Tian Huang said, what do you mean? I've been teaching you the whole time. And Long Tan said, what have you been teaching me? And Tian Huang said, when you greet me, I bow. When I sit, you stand beside me. When you bring tea, I receive it from you. Later on, Long Tan became a Zen teacher himself, and, and one of his disciples was Deshan, who was a very great Zen master too. Here's the other story. One day while Guishan was lying down, Yangshan came to see him. And Guishan said, let me tell you about my dream. And Yangshan leaned forward to listen to him. And Guishan just said, would you interpret my dream for me? I want to see how you do it. So Yangshan left the room and came back a moment later with a basin of water and a towel. Guishan washed his face and sat up. And just then, Shangguan came in. And Guishan said, Yangshan and I have been sharing miracles. This is no small matter. And Xiangyan said, I know, I was next door and I heard you. And Guishan said to him, well, why don't you try? Xiangyan made a bowl of tea and brought it to him. And Guishan praised both of them, saying to them, you two Zen students surpass even Shariputra and Modgalyana with your miraculous activity. So by the sort of standard and logic of the way we conceive of relationships, doesn't seem like these stories are really about that at all. Because when we say relationship, we mean two or more people engaged with one another, sometimes happily, sometimes unhappily, usually some mixture of both. But that doesn't seem to be what's going on in these stories. In these stories, the characters, if there are any characters, seem to be meeting on another plane entirely. All of them are entering completely the Dharma gate of deepest truth and awakening. So between them, there's a kind of wordless harmony and trust. No one is needing to fulfill anyone else's needs. No one needs to understand anyone else or even 
be kind and supportive in the ordinary ways that we would recognize. Their encounter seems to go beyond all that. Their love runs deeper. Sometimes people complain about Zen practice as being excessively formal. We, we remember, I, I just had a visit from my seven-year-old granddaughter and uh, she, she was resistant to table manners, you know? Like, why do you have to bother me with that, you know? And I tried to explain to her, well, look, when you don't sit up close to the table, when you don't use your fork, look at me on my hands and knees having to clean up after you. <laughs> She was not impressed with this. <laughs> anyway, we, we all have these memories of, you know, don't put your elbows on the table and so on. So, or worse memories. So uh, we don't like formal things. Zen is often get, gets a bad name for its formality, but it's all about formality, isn't it? After all, the robes, the chanting, prescribed way of walking and standing and sitting, the bells, the schedule, the atmosphere. The point of it is that it enacts, whether we understand it or not, it enacts this transcendent sort of relationship. When we enter into the Zen forms in everyday temple life or when we go to the temple once in a while for sitting if we don't live there or if we go to Sashin where we're all monastics together for a time we are literally practicing every day being covered all over by the whole world Till there is nothing left of us inside and out but the whole world. I don't know that we can have convincing explanations for this, but we do live it and, and we feel it and, and we understand it in our bones, if not with our conceptual minds. Poems are made of words, but poems are not explanations or conceptual renderings. So I'm going to uh, read you a poem I came across the other day when I was rereading uh, his great book, Robert Creeley's great book from the 1980s, uh, Mirrors. I used to uh, wait patiently for every Robert Creeley book, like we used to wait for all the new Beatles albums in the 1960s and 70s. So this one is called Mirrors, this book, and, and the poem I'm going to read you is called The Edge. So I'll read it a couple times and just say a few things about it, and that'll, that'll be the end of my talk. And since uh, I've been so thoroughly brainwashed by the Dharma, everything looks like the Dharma to me. So this poem also seems like it's a Dharma poem. Bob Creeley, as far as I know, is not a Dharma student, but he certainly was aware of the Dharma and no doubt to some extent influenced by it. But never mind, it doesn't really matter because the Dharma really is everywhere. You don't need to be a Dharma student to be influenced by and your whole life turned by the Dharma. So here's the poem, The Edge. Long over whatever edge, backward a false distance, 
here and now sentiment. To begin again, forfeit in whatever sense an end, to give up thought of it, hanging on the weather's edge, hope, a sufficiency, thinking of love's accident, this long way, come with no purpose, face again, changing these hands, feet beyond me, coming home, an intersection, crossing of one and many, having all, having nothing, feeling, thought, heart, head, generalities, all abstract, no place for me or mine. I take the world and lose it, miss it, misplace it, put it back or try to, can't, find it, fool it, even feel it, the snow from a high sky, gray, floats down to me softly. This must be the edge of being before the thought of it blurs it, can only try to recall it. The edge. What edge is he talking about? The edge of what? Well, to be me or you, right? There has to be an edge, the end, the edge where you stop and the edge where I begin. But is there an edge? Also, you know, we say, He's really edgy. What does that mean? I think Robert Creeley, I, I didn't know him. I, I met him, but I didn't know him. I know a lot of people who knew him really well. And when he was young, he was really edgy. He, he drank a lot. He was constantly getting beaten up or beating somebody up in a bar. But he's writing this poem as, a, as an older person. And he's long over whatever edge he might have had, which was built on a false distance, he says. But also when you say long over, it evokes the idea of longing as anybody who's older can look back on a past, recognizing sometimes with embarrassment how foolish one has been. And at the same time, it's very tender one's former self. Here and now, sentiment. Here and now is a feeling, right? Of being here and now, there's a feeling in living, there's always a feeling of living. Even if you don't know what it is, even if you're thinking about something else or worried about something else, there's a very distinctive feeling to being here in this life now. Love's accident. You meet somebody, you know, let's say, like in my case, I meet somebody and then uh, 45 years goes by. 45 years, in a few weeks, it'll be 45 years I've been married to my wife, Kathy, who some of you know very well because Kathy participates a lot at Upaya as a Zen priest. She's a very elegant and wonderful Zen priest. 45 years, but I might not have made, met, met her, right? It was an accident. Love is always an accident. 
hanging on the weather's edge. So the edge appears again. The weather's edge. What what is that? What is that? The weather's edge. But aren't we always hanging on the weather's edge? People always talk about the weather. You know, every day there's report about the weather. And it changes, doesn't it? And the way life feels is the way the weather feels. The weather has a big impact, even though we think we're so smart and we live inside buildings and we can control the climate inside the buildings. But actually, it's a spring day or a fall day or a rainy day or a snowy day or a very, very hot day. And, and, that, and that's our life. The weather might not be a physical phenomenon. It might be a metaphor. Maybe the whole world is a metaphor for what it's like to be here and now, this feeling of the weather. And we all come a long way with no purpose. And, uh, you know, my granddaughter, she just left the other day, so I'm thinking about her. 10 years from now, she, she will hardly recognize her hands and her feet and her face. Sometimes I see a photograph of myself a long time ago and I can barely acknowledge that person they say was myself. And when he says coming home an intersection, maybe he's talking about literally you walk home, you know, you pass several intersections. People cross the street. I once wrote a poem about people crossing the street at, at an intersection. But every moment is an intersection, right? That's what I was saying about emptiness. Every moment is an intersection. We cross one and many having everything and nothing. And everything really that we think about who we think we are and what we think life is and our life is and life itself is, all generalities, really, all abstractions, even what we think our emotions are is an abstraction. There is no place for me or mine because that's an abstraction. So we take the world, we lose it. We can be nostalgic for it, even while we're in the middle of it. We, we are looking around for it. We don't know where it is. We can't find it. We can't fool it, because it's always true. Sometimes we can't even feel it. And then the, the best line for me in the poem, the most subtle and perfect moment in the poem is when he writes, the snow from a high sky, gray, floats down to me softly. He doesn't say floats down on me softly. Did you notice that? The difference between the snowflake floating down to me softly and floating down on me softly is a big difference. If it floats down on me, it's doing something to me. If it floats down to me, it's as if it's meeting me. It's as if I'm calling it and it comes to me. And the world does do that. The world does come to me because I call it. It comes to you because you call it. And the world calls to you and you come to it, whether or not you know that's what's happening. This must be the edge of being before the thought of it blurs it. Can only try to recall it. So this, I think, is what we learn about our thinking mind in Zazen. 
our thinking mind misses things, blurs things, tries to recall things. We have to be thinking. We're thinking creatures. It's so poignant to me how our thinking is so necessary to us and always misses the mark, and that's its beauty. We're trying to recall the world with every thought, and we can never do it. Sometimes we feel it when we sit. And then as soon as we try to have it with our thinking, it's gone. And, and we don't even know if it ever was there. I'll read the poem again, and then I'll be done. The Edge. Long over whatever edge, backward a false distance here and now, sentiment. To begin again, forfeit in whatever sense and end, to give up thought of it, hanging on the weather's edge, hope, a sufficiency, thinking of love's accident, this long way come with no purpose, face again, changing, these hands, feet beyond me, coming home, an intersection, crossing of one and many, having all, having nothing, feeling thought, heart, head, generalities, all abstract, no place for me or mine. I take the world and lose it, miss it, misplace it, put it back or try to, can't, find it, fool it, even feel it, the snow from a high sky, gray, floats down to me softly. This must be the edge of being before the thought of it blurs it, can only try to recall it. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful poem? It's, it's very frustrating for me because uh, I always try to write a poem as good as a Robert Creeley poem, and I never do it. Isn't that sad, you know, all these decades go by. <laughs> Robert Creeley, God bless him, he's long gone. He died in 2006, but he still writes the best poems, and uh, I still read his poems and try to write poems that good, but you can't do it. I can't do it. So good we have his poem. And maybe I did write that, actually. Maybe I was lying to you when I said it was a Robert Creeley poem. Perhaps it was my own poem, but I was too embarrassed to say so. <laughs> Thank you all for being there and, and listening. Uh, Norman, you're a tricky Zen master. <laughs> Thank you for that talk and for that beautiful poem. Yes. Um, I wonder if you could say a couple things about uh, what we'll be doing on Saturday. Or will we get to hear some of your poetry? Uh, should you admit to Ray? I could, I've been just the last couple of days writing poems. Maybe I could read a few of them. But no, I thought what we would do on Saturday is uh, in both segments, we would start with a little sitting, maybe a little guided sitting. And, and then uh, I would present some material from the book, not reading from the text, but also uh, just talking. And, uh, and then after some presentation time, I, I think we could go into groups and discuss a little bit in groups and then have plenty of time for dialogue with whoever is there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna depend on people having things that they wanna bring up and wanna talk about. I won't limit 
my responses to the topic, so we'll be pretty open with it. So in the morning, uh, we would do the emptiness teachings, which I really love and which are so important to um, everything in the Dharma. And then in the afternoon, talk about engagement and what is, what is engagement. It's, it's an interesting point. And I think to me, a very, really, really important point is we all know what social engagement is. We know what political activism is and, and what's the difference between uh, how we would do that emptiness teaching. practitioners and how we would do other uh, So important to... Oh, I'm hearing myself again. <laughs> Sorry, I think uh, okay. Rishi just joined. And... Yes, she did. I see that. <laughs> there, yeah. Well, so that's I, wonderful, Norman. I, thank I, you. That's what we do on Saturday, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody on Saturday. Hi, Rishi. Awesome. Good to see you there. Oh, now she's muted. So. <laughs> she's muted, but we know what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Rishi, you're muted still. But... Sorry. Uh, I was on the YouTube channel listening oh, to you, and oh. so I was getting the double effect. I got twice as much of you. Oh, yes. Did you? Wasn't that a wonderful? Anyway, lot? thank People? you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. And you know what, Noah, what, what it was, was I did give a talk at Upaya in May, but it was Upaya in Tucson. Ah, in Santa Fe, it was with with Al's group. Al's group. Oh, cool. I got mixed up. Yeah, right. Well, then we were both right. Yeah, we were both right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Norman. And I put the link for uh, for everyone who wants to join on Saturday. Uh, it's being freely offered, and of course, Donna is appreciated. And uh, and so, thank you for your generosity, Norman, and thank you everyone for joining with us tonight and for Saturday. And we'll end uh, with the four vows. I vow to remind.